And um, so anyway, so for tonight's class, uh, it's blessing or curse, and we choose. And so the definition of a curse is a prayer or an invocation for harm or injury to come upon one. All right? Uh, it's a solemn, a curse is a solemn utterance intended to invoke a supernatural power to inflict harm or punishment on someone or something. All right? So word curses releases hell's agenda, if you want to look at it like that. The enemy loves when we speak curses. When we speak you know, I'm going to talk about self-imposed curses. I'm going to talk about different ways that we can curse ourselves. But the good thing is we have the victory. The good thing is, is that the devil's under our feet. And you heard, you know, that song was just so awesome. And that, um, you know, we win. But a lot of times we don't understand and we don't recognize the power that God has given us. But also we don't want to walk in defeat. And we don't want to have an open door where we allow the enemy to come in and destroy us and, and to take advantage of us. And so um, I, I unplugged that accidentally. So if you want to plug that light back in, I don't know if you need it. So anyhow, so word curse is released, as I said, hell's agenda. And everything in the spirit realm is created and established by words. You know that, right? So I'm going to read to you out of uh, Hebrews 11.3 out of the Passion Version. It says here, faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's words, right? He spoke in the invisible realm, gave birth to all that is seen. So we know that that's why decrees are really important when we pray. That's why we have to watch what we say. I didn't say we have to be paranoid over what we say. We just need to be aware of our language, aware of what we're saying, okay? And so, again, I love that portion of Scripture, you know, that, that the world was framed by the words that God spoke. And so we're made in his image. We're made in his image. Let there be light. What's happening? We're made in his image. See, there you go. <laughs> oh, please. So, but now I can't. Okay. All right. Now I need some light here, brother. Um, um, no, I think I'm all right. All right. So, um, Again, we, we need to recognize the power of what we're saying, okay? So I'm going to bring this point out. So on your handout, I have these scriptures. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, in the Amplified, it says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today. Therefore, I've set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, you shall choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. And we'll talk about what does that mean. Deuteronomy 28, 45 and 20, uh, 46 uh, says, so all these curses will come on you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And they will be a sign and a wonder to you and your descendants forever. And I added verse 47, which is not on your handout, because you did not serve the Lord with a heart full of joy and gladness for the abundance of all things which he has blessed you with. Now, this seems really harsh. But see, the thing is, is that God has given us the, 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 the choice. And so when we choose to go contrary to the word, it's an open door for the enemy to come in and, and harm us. See, that's what the Lord is saying. It's not that, you know, now remember, we're in a new covenant. We're in a new dispensation. We have the cross. We have the Jesus died on a cross for us. And, you know, we just celebrated Passover. And, um, you know, he rose from the dead on our behalf and for our freedom. But this still applies. Okay. And so even in the New Testament, we still need to watch and we'll go over that. What the, what the Lord is saying to us, we have to understand that this is no joke. Okay. And so we have to look at, like, let's say in our family line, where there are things that could be holding us back. All right. And it's not necessarily, it's not like, well, you, this is your lot in life, honey, and that's it. No, Jesus came to set us free, but then we don't want to align with that lie. Okay. In Exodus 20, verses 3 through 5, in the New Living Translation, it says, You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. 
I lay the sins of the parents upon their children, and the entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. So, you know, we, we know that, that idolatry is sin. We know that putting our children before God, putting work before God, we know that there's different things that we know that our heart isn't true and surrendered to the Lord can hinder us, right? And so, again, the Lord wants us to understand that, that we cannot have anything to, you know, before him. And, again, it's, it's at his love for us. You know, again, these scriptures are very strong, but we need to hear these things, all right? And so, but you know that God is merciful, that he's a God of love. So I want to always balance it out with that. He's not looking to whack us over the head with a mallet, you know, to, to say, well, you messed up now and that's it. That's not the heart of God. Amen. But we are to be accountable for our choices, right? Yeah. And so, I, you know, I look always and, and I always ask Holy Spirit, just show me my heart. Show me uh, what I need to address in my family. Show me, you know, if there's anything that's blocking uh, me from walking in the blessing of the Lord, you know, because there's seasons that Holy Spirit uncovers things too. There's not, it's not always like everything all at once. It's a progressive thing that the Holy Spirit uncovers and reveals to us. But I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus wants us living a life of abundance. Jesus wants us li living a life of freedom. That much I promise you. Yeah. And it's up to us, whatever we, you know, however we apply ourselves. Now, in Deuteronomy 11, 26, and 27, in the New Living, it says here, Look today, I'm giving you the choice between a blessing and a curse. You will be blessed if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. All right? So that's the promise of the Lord. But, you know, the enemy always wants us to, you know, I talk about our head trash. He always wants to lie to us and let us think, well, you know, we did do something wrong or, you know, we're never going to get out of this. This is always going to be this cycle that we go through. That's not, listen, God is saying, yeah, that might be now. But he's saying, but listen, I'm going to give you a way of escape. And that's 1 Corinthians 15. He always provides a way of escape for us. And so sometimes have you ever felt like in your family, and some of you, you we've been through this gazillion times we've gone through deliverance we've gone through pressing through and making sure that our, our you know we're healed and our family line is healed but there's times we just have to really war over these things right but how many times you ever felt like there's an invisible barrier i've heard people like when we've ministered to them they said it's like a dark cloud follows us i just can't seem to get out from under that right well that could be doesn't mean it is but it could be a curse and so it's like, all right, Lord, we want to see what in our family line or what am I doing that's contrary to your word. Listen, doctors get it. When you go to a doctor, what does he ask you to do? Fill out a form, and he asks about your background. He asks about the sickness, hereditary illnesses, right? They get it. And so here it's no different. The Bible talks about there's iniquitous patterns that could be in our family line. There's generational stuff, and it, a lot of it is habit. It's stuff that has gone down in our family line that, that continues over and over again, right? How many times have you seen in the family, like, we'll meet with people, and we'll ask them, let's say about a family, and then you'll see, like, almost every other family member has been divorced. Uh, we know of somebody that uh, in their family, they were all barren. Nobody was, they would always miscarry. And then the one couple, they actually really pressed through and sought the Lord and prayed and God showed them, and, and she conceived. It's the first one in her family. See, God wants us to break that curse. He wants us to break that, that cause that's trying to prevent us from living that abundant life. And so um, this is what we're going to talk about tonight. How do we do that? Sometimes you can have artifacts in your home, you know, uh, prior to, uh, well, I mean, prior to really getting into this, I, I worked for the airlines, and I traveled a lot. So you pick up a lot of things. I had sun gods, I had stuff in Japan, I had all these crazy dragons, you know, different things that was on, you know, really pretty silk kimono. I just liked the color, I didn't care about that. But, so when I got saved, the Lord said to me, you need to get rid of these things, half the stuff I throw out. I didn't realize that there was, there could be something attached to it, right? And so the spirits could be attached to it. That's another way that the enemy thinks he's so sly, how he can get in 
and, and steal from us and cause and wreak havoc in your home. There's a scripture in Leviticus that literally talks about where the priests would come in and they would, like if there was green streak, I haven't read, read it in a while, green or, or uh, red streaks in, in the wall that they can deci decipher bitterness or uh, anger that was in the home. How many times have you, well, like we've gone through homes and we prayed in homes where there was so much strife and, and fighting in the home. There was a spirit in that home. Wow. Or like if somebody died in the home, there was a murder in the home. Or a lot of times it's just sin, you know. But, but that's why we pray cleansing in the house. And how do you pray cleansing? Well, you know, we all have oil. The oil is not anything, you know, spooky, hooky. It's just a sign of, you know, like Holy Spirit. We anoint everything, plead, your, plead the blood of Jesus, and take authority over anything that we may be sensing in your home. Pray cleansing in your home. I do it a lot and pray cleansing. I know somebody I was ministering to is very wealthy, and uh, we were talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, and, and this particular individual was um, involved in Buddhism. And I said, oh, all right. I says, well... I said, I was just sharing testimony about the power of God and the great I am. Yeah. And uh, you could be connected to that satellite dish or this one with all the power is, right? And so she was telling me that she has a shaman come in and clean her home for $5,000 a month. Okay? I said, well, let me tell you, the blood of Jesus is free. Jesus died on the cross, and he came to set us free. And we don't have to pay a shaman. We can, we can pray and cleanse our home for free. That's the beauty of the Lord. Jesus died on the cross for all of us, right? And so one of the things about witchcraft and the occult, they always charge you a lot of money in, in what they do. And, um, you know, it's like even to put curses on people sometimes, it could be like $25,000. So it's a lot of money involved in that. Anyway, so Deuteronomy 7, 25 through 26 in the New Living Translation says, You must burn your idols in fire. And you must not cover the silver or gold that covers them. You must not take it or it will become a trap to you, for it is detestable to the Lord your God. Do not bring any detestable objects into your home, for then you will be destroyed just like them. You must utterly detest such things, for they are set apart for your destruction. So in other words, you know, obviously we have to make sure, be careful what you bring in your home. That's why you have to be careful what you watch on TV, what you allow in your home. I don't want any spirit coming through my TV. It, listen, the enemy will come in any which way he can. And it's not that I'm paranoid. I'm not, I choose not to. First of all, I always say to people, would Jesus sit there and watch that with you? If Jesus can't watch it with you, you know that you shouldn't watch it. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> so anyway, so both blessings and cursings belong to the spiritual realm. And their vehicles are the supernatural. And the enemy knows that. And so the main vehicle of any kind of blessings or curses are words, words that we say. Proverbs 11:9 in the Amplified says, With his mouth the godless man destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge and discernment the righteous will be rescued. Another one says here in Proverbs 12:18 in the Passion, it says, Reckless words are like the thrust of a sword, cutting remarks meant to stab and to hurt. But the words of the wise soothe and heal. So there are words, there, there's word curses. You know, let's look at like even in family right now. Um, you know, again, our families have done the best that they could. But what about like sometimes family members? I, I was talking with someone who said that uh, her, one of the family members always said that you'll never make it. You'll always be left back. You're stupid. You're this. You're never going to accomplish anything. But guess what? They were left back, right? So words are powerful because you, 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 you really align with it and, it, and it's cutting. It, it hurts your heart, and the enemy knows that. And then what happens is we, we believe the lie. Then there's that open door for the enemy to really attack us. Now, it doesn't mean that everything's a spirit, but it can develop into a place where you have a spirit, all right? And so that's where I'm always, I'm, I'm pretty careful, even about self-imposed curses, which I'll go over in a minute, but I don't want to go there just yet. And, um, you know, the Bible talks about an iniquitous pattern that's been in our family line, okay? The, he, the Hebrew word for iniquity is avon, A-V-O-N. 
and that word means to bind, to twist, to distort, to do wrong. It means, uh, if you look it up in the dictionary, I don't know if I, f if I put this on your handout. It means immoral behavior. It's perverse. It's deliberate. It means to, pr to, to behave in an unacceptable way. And a lot of times in our family line, generationally, listen, there are many families that have tremendous blessings. I mean, there's just, you know, the, the power of the testimony is God's keeping power in their family, right? But generationally, in, in a lot of families, that's not always the case. And so there's a lot of wrongdoing in families, right? There's a lot of sin. There's a lot of behavioral patterns that, that continue. Well, my father always did that. My, fa my great-grandfather had a bad temper. My daddy had a bad temper. And I have a bad temper. Well, that's an iniquitous pattern that needs to be broken, right? It's, it's a perverse behavior. It's unacceptable. It's not okay. Jesus said that we can change anything that needs to be changed. With God, nothing shall be called impossible. So, again, you know, we, it's not, again, it's not like we have to walk this perfect line. Everything's going to be oh so wonderful. That's not the case. If that's the case for you, you can come lay hands on me and pray. But um, what it is is us, you know, go and be, like David cried out and he said, Lord, you know, you know create in me a clean heart, a pure heart before you that I might not sin. And so, and that's the thing. It's like, Lord, we just want our hearts to be pure and honorable that we're not going to sin before you, right? In Proverbs 18, 7, in the New King James Version, it says, A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. See, I don't, I don't want my mouth to be my destruction. And so, how many times do we curse ourselves, right? Lord knows we've done it a lot. Our mouths are agents of power, and when we speak the word of the Lord, we're creating power, God's power over us. But, you know, the enemy un also understands the power of our words, and so that's why, like, when you're really struggling or if you're angry over something, you know, we can release some negative stuff, right? And so, but he knows the power of it. And, and but listen, God is saying, choose, make a choice. And, you know, some people are like, oh, that's so fanatical. You don't want to be so concerned over every word. Well, I don't know about you. I want to be concerned about what I'm speaking over my life. And I'm not paranoid about it. I just, you know, words access the spirit realm. And so a word curse can release or when you're cursing and you're, you're being so negative, it can have, you know, a demonic intent or access. And, and that open door where you start believing it and its heaviness comes and destruction. What about when you're around someone who's really negative all the time and always speaking negative, negative, I can't, I'll never, I'm always going to be this way, it's never going to change. And you're in that atmosphere and that environment or if it's an angry environment, you feel that presence, you feel that horrible, like, spirit, but you can change that through pray, through worship, through our declarations, like, you know, we are to be atmosphere changers because we have the Spirit of God within us, right? So um, the enemy, he's an illegal trespasser, and when he tries to mess with us, he knows, like when we know who we are in Christ, he can't, he can't curse us. The enemy can't just curse us. He can't curse what God has blessed. The only way he can get in there to uh, attack us is when we are believing the lie or we're operating in a generational curse or that iniquitous pattern that's been perpetuated down the family line. But then again, we have the power of the blood. We overcome the enemy by the word of our testimony, by the blood of the lamb, right? And we shut the door. We repent for that. And then we always ask Holy Spirit, show us where we're not in proper alignment. And so we are blessed people. And so, again, the enemy is going to lie to us to try to let us see, well, you're, you know, you're going to always have this curse. You're going to have this curse situation. I know somebody um, that, um, you know, we know that um, some, if you can even share, whose uh, family, most of the family members have died prematurely. Well, that's, that's a spirit of premature death and destruction, right? So we have to break that. And, and we pray a prayer, Lord, I repent. On behalf of my aunt, and we're going to pray later, but on behalf of my ancestors where they op there's an open door to sin that have caused premature death. I don't know why. Listen, we're not going to know everything about our ancestors, right? But if we see the root there, we see the fruit, then there's a root. So we're going to just pray and repent and renounce, okay? And Because that's what the scripture tells us to do. Because, again, Jesus wants us free. And that's the beauty of this whole thing. It's, and again, like I said earlier, it's not that everything's a spirit. It's just 
sometimes it's a behavioral thing that we need to shift. It's habit because if everybody's done it for so long. All right, so there, the enemy searches for a breach in the wall. He looks, that's why he loves when we walk in unforgiveness. He loves when we have an offended spirit. Oh, he loves that one. Spirit of offense, right? He loves when we're pointing the finger and we're being judgmental and critical and murmur and complain. See, these are open doors. He can enter, through, enter in through words. He can enter in through trauma, right? Trauma can open up a door, oaths that we've made, vows, inner vows that we made. There are, there are many opportunities. And again, Holy Spirit, you know, that's what I love about the Holy Spirit. He's inside us. It's, he's the spirit of Jesus, right? And he, he will d direct us. He will tell us what's happening. So we don't have to be afraid. We are not a defeated people. I want you to understand this. We are blessed. And we are the head and not the tail. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. Now, there are two types of word curses that we have to deal with. Now, we have witchcraft curses. And I didn't put on your handout, but in, in Deuteronomy 18, I think it's Deuteronomy 18, it talks about any kind of witchcraft, um, you know, any, anything that, like, you got involved in, like, with um, uh, horoscope, uh, uh, anything even just seemed like, uh, like it was just a fun thing to do. It's an abomination to the Lord. And so even ignorantly that you may have gotten involved in that, um, it is Deuteronomy 18. It op it's an open door to the enemy, and that you have to renounce and pray through. How many times, I mean, as kids, even though, I mean, I only play with it once, but Ouija boards, tarot cards. Uh, I, we had an aunt that would, uh, I mean, she was right on. She would read your fortune with reg regular playing cards. Um, you know, so there, then the Italians would do this thing. You can only do it on East, uh, Christmas uh, Eve and you know, this uh, my loikia thing and whatever they would do and <laughs> to either break a curse, but meanwhile they're putting a curse on us and um, to break the evil spirits over you and all this crazy stuff. But we all believed it. Traditionally, right, people do this stuff in families. And so we had to renounce all that stuff. I'm like, oh, my God, I, lo I loved all that stuff. I loved Bewitched. I loved anything that had to do with, like, any kind of magical powers. It was appealing. But d even today now, don't, d you know, they make everything so appealing. When, you're, when you watch the cartoons, we, you know, they, what's that one that um, that lady wrote all those books? Uh, what the heck's it called? Harry Potter, right? I mean, we have Christians who get mad at us if we talk about Harry Potter. And let me tell you something. Harry Potter teaches kids how to put curses on people, wow. to vex them, to hex them. An incantation. Listen, we have to be aware of what these kids are watching. I don't care if everybody makes it sound like it's so wonderful. Oh, you're being so fanatical. No, I'm not. You're opening yourself up to a, a demonic assignment. Yeah. And so in, in Deuteronomy 18, it says here, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can read it. And it talks about, it says, there shall not, in verse 10, it said, it's not on your handout. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire as a sacrifice, one who uses divination and fortune telling, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer, or one who casts a charm or a spell or a medium or a spiritist or a necromancy who seeks the dead. For everyone who does these things is utterly repulsive to the Lord. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God is driving them before you. And in, in the King James, it says it's an abomination to the Lord. Okay? So then you can read through the whole thing. So these are all things that, you know, the, the, the enemy makes it so appealing, especially Disney World. So much of that is witchcraft. I'm not saying you can't go to Disney World, but I'm just saying a lot of it has a cult root system there. And so when, so when a witchcraft, when someone in the occult, when somebody is a sorcerer or spiritist, when they are releasing a word curse, they're operating under the power of the enemy. So that's one aspect of a curse. So I'm not really, this is more of an overview of blessings and cursings because uh, the, the second module we'll do, we'll, go, we'll, we'll really dive into it, all right? The second type of word curse is the work of the flesh, all right? It's when people speak out of hurt, anger, your offense, your fears. Um, they say something that attacks the mind of another and decrees an evil outcome. It's not intentional, but it's out of in ignorance. Now, I'm going to say this. How many times have 
people in certain churches left churches and and they've been cursed because they left the church that's happened a lot and so that is not god you don't curse people and so we're the bride of christ (laughs) that's who owns us nobody else right so when you speak against people when you speak word curses that's that's wrong and and you know we you know we cursing people leaving churches or saying that you know their kids will this will happen to them your church will falter you'll never amount to anything that is a word curse and so you reject that word curse you break the power of that word curse amen um james 3 5 and 6 in the passion says and so the tongue is a small part of the body yet it carries great power just think of how a small flame can set a huge forest ablaze and the tongue is a fire it can be compared to the sum of total uh, to some total of wickedness and is the most dangerous part of our human body it corrupts the entire body and is a hellish flame it releases a fire that can be burned throughout the course of human existence the tongue is powerful right words hurt we used to say six and stones are hurt break my bones but names will never hurt that is so untrue i'd rather you hit me than, than say things about me it hurts james 3 9 and 10 but don't hit me please <laughs> Amen. We use our tongue to praise God our Father and then turn around and curse a person who is made in the very image of him. Out of the same mouth we pour out words of praise one minute and curses the next. My brother and sisters, this should never be. We have got to watch what we say. Proverbs twenty one twenty three. Watch your words and be careful what you say, and you'll be surprised by how few troubles you'll have. Ain't that the truth? If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. But see, we don't under, see why am I going through all these scriptures? Because it affects us spiritually. All right, Leviticus 20 verse 9 says, If anyone, now this is big, if anyone curses his father or mother, he shall most certainly be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother, his blood is on him. That is, he bears full responsibility for the consequences. Now, that's also in Exodus. Now, let me just say this. That could be a hard one, especially when there's been abuse, right? And the Bible says that if, you know, it don't, like, uh, your, the life will go well with you if you don't curse your family, right? You don't want to curse your mother and father. And so there's a, a, the principle there is that we choose to forgive them. We're not blessing them for the harm that they created or what they've done. But we, we don't want to curse them because that's what the Bible says we're not to do honor your mother and father it says that your life will go well with you and i also like to take it too to those that that are like you know just even older people those that you respect leaders you know just watch what you say watch how you talk even listen i have to say this you know we have this whole election thing that everybody's up in arms over right still is and um i I was just appalled by the way people have cursed different leaders and um it's wrong i mean listen i don't like certain ones at all but the lord we have to watch what we say and how we we speak about them because they still are god's children whether we like to believe that or not and so we just have to be careful about that you know i feel very strongly about my belief system and about who i think should be president but doesn't give me the right to curse anybody right so when i saw some of the thing that's why i had i really pulled back off of facebook for a while because i couldn't i just couldn't stand to see what i was seeing and reading and how people were both sides were really cursing and coming against and cursing and i thought oh my gosh and uh it was just it was grievous it really was and i thought "Mm, that's not cool and um so two wrongs don't make a right, right right and uh so we just need to be careful of that so anyway so but you know, honor your mother and father, that your well, your life will go well with you. Okay, so now tell me, you know, you may say, yeah, but I have a, a rotten father who abused me, who did this to me, and who did that to me. That's legit, right? And, and so we get that, and the Lord understands that as well. But it's, Lord, you know, I choose to forgive them. I choose to release to her. And see, the thing is, it's not just a prayer. It's a process, and he'll bring you through healing your heart over that situation because that will eat you up 
say God's forgiveness, and I've said this before, is, is his, it's his gift to us. As when he teaches us about forgiving, when he teaches us about releasing the pain in our heart, it's so that we can be healed, so that we can be helped. It's not letting them off the hook. Having that, like even if they're past, they're past, you, you still want to release that. If they're even alive, but you still want to release that because it brings healing to your heart. And my husband always talks about Joyce Myers, right? Like, oh my gosh, what this woman went through. And she bought them a house. The Lord told her to, you know, to minister to them. And, you know, there's all this craziness. I thought, Lord, I don't know if I can do what she did. But, but that was her and how the Lord directed her, right? And so, but we don't know what we would do in that situation that's why we also have to be careful how, how we can become so critical and judgmental because we don't know what that person has gone through right. we don't know what they walk through we don't know the pain that they that's been in their heart and how they had to overcome right so we have to be careful of that um so let's see so in proverbs 26 2 in the passion we, we use this scripture a lot. An undeserved curse will be powerless to harm you. We, in the King James, it says, a curse causeless shall not come. So I like the way this is worded. It says, an undeserved curse will be powerless to harm you. It may flutter over you like a bird, but it will find no place to land. Wow. See, the enemy will try, but he can't land. We're not going to be a landing sure for the enemy, right? So curse can't take effect unless there's a cause for it. Now, how, how, how can that be? Well, unforgiveness is number one. Offenses, right? Walking in, in bitterness or resentment or self-imposed curses. This is a major open door. And, uh, you know, I had to break every word curse I ever spoke over myself. You're not tall enough. You're not skinny enough. You're not this enough. You're not. You're stupid. You're never amount to anything. But because things were spoken over you, you believe it. And we counsel a lot here. And woo we we hear a lot of stuff. And, and listen, I had my own set of stuff <laughs> that I can relate to. But, you know, we just have to watch what we say over ourselves because, listen, our body, uh, you know, it's responding to our words. Yes, that's right. Yeah. If you hate yourself, if you hate the way you look, you hate the way you sound, guess what? You, you respond to that. Right. And that's where it's like the Bible says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. So I had a real issue in this, this self-hatred thing. And so um, I had to really choose to allow the word to have final say. It didn't matter what I felt. Because well, how, how many times do you say, you say, oh, I feel this. Oh, I don't know. I feel that. Well, God's saying, listen, it's not about your feeling. It's by faith. And so it's not that we're discounting that. It's like, all right, Lord, I need you to deal with the root issues here. That's that where I am so out of alignment with your word. And so if the word is saying we are to walk in love, we are to be able to receive his love where, where he's ravished by us and we can't receive that. We have the problem, not him. So, again, that's an open door. I had to work on that. See, we have to work on these things. Yes, God is saying, listen, I died for your freedom. But then again, it's like, OK, well, how bad do you want freedom? You have to apply yourself. We have, to re we have to research the word. We have to look into it and say, wait a second. I am not going to sit here and self-pity and whine and just, you know, always like, oh, woe is me. I'm telling you, the enemy loves that. How is that victorious? It's not, I'm not saying that you don't have problems, but guess what? He said, I want you to serve me with joy and gladness. You know why? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And when you're in a depressed state, when you're in a hopeless state, that, that you're weak. You don't feel like you want to sleep. You don't have energy. And, and you're, you're, you're alone. You don't, you're isolate. And then how he really picks at you. And he really whispers lies to you. He knows what he's doing, but God is greater. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And so when, you be, when that becomes such a reality to you and you meditate on that, I'm telling you, it's like those girls were dancing. You're not going to tell me anything different. When the enemy comes in to whisper, I love what, uh, we say it all the time, what um, Sharon Park said. We say, shut up. Shut up. Here's what the word says. That's why, that's why you need to know the word. And I told you, I had, you know, because, the, you know, I still do it. I don't, I'm not big on the computers. I, I get my little index cards. Hey, you may like your computer. God bless you. 
write it out. I like to write my scriptures out. I decree them. I write them out. I meditate on the word. When you meditate on the word day and night, the Bible says in Joshua 1, 8, there and you will have good success and you will prosper. We all have to do this. And listen, I'm saved a long time. I have to continuously do it. It's not like, like I'm struggling in it. I enjoy it. You get to this place where it's, it's like water. You know, just a beautiful stream of living water running over you. It's just awesome. So we have to break every word curse that's been spoken to us. And we break the power of negative words. That's what I'll say. Lord, I break the power. I take authority over every negative word curse that was spoken over me. And I repent, Lord, for where I have aligned with it and believed it. Yeah. See? And, I, and, and so we, we proclaim that over our lives. So we have generational curses in the Bible. How many of us, like in our families, we can say, well, we have a generational curse of alcoholism. We have a generational curse of rebellion or disobedience or murder. You know, there's been violence in my family. Well, we have the right to renounce that. We have the right to break that in our family line. Now, a lot of it, again, is through behavioral issues that have been taught. And so, you know, hurt people hurt people. You don't just become mean. It's because stuff happens. You don't just become wounded. It's because stuff happens, right? right? When you see, you know, I remember, uh, I'm not even going to go there, but th there's, just different, there's just different scenarios, and you know when a person's come from, up from a really good family life, right? And they had nurture and love from their mother and father, and they were blessed, they were disciplined, they were taught of the Lord. They're, they're wonderful. And you have a kid that, 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 let's say, they were beaten by their parents and, and not, you know, not taken care of, and, and you know, they had a supply for themselves, and they have a rougher upbringing. Doesn't mean now they didn't amount to anything, because many have, but they turned around. Their lives turned around because they apply themselves, but you do see the difference. Like I'll, I'll listen to people and they'll say, I had such a wonderful relationship with my parents, especially my dad. And you can see the difference in their confidence. You really can. Because the parents' love is so important. But you may say, yeah, but I didn't have any of that. But he's the perfect father. Yeah. And listen, Adam and Eve had the perfect father and they sinned. So for parents, don't feel guilty. He's the perfect father, right? And so... That's what we have to remember, that God's saying, listen, girl, I have a way of escape for everything you're going through. I want you to trust me. And that's why I love Proverbs 3 where it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. You see? And I, and I believe him for that. Amen. So, so we have inherited demons. But Jesus is saying, listen, you don't have to stay with them. You can take authority of them. When I got saved, I said, no, I reject a lot of this stuff. But then, then it was a part of me was renewing my mind and, and really getting aligned properly with the Lord, right? And uh, I'm going to skip through some of this. What time is it? Okay. Um, okay. So now in his book, Blessing or Curse, he has seven indications of a curse, and uh, he really goes into detail. Again, his book is called Blessing or Curse by Derek Prince, and it's outstanding. All right, so number one, it's on your handout. It says mental and or emotional breakdown. When you see that just because somebody has a breakdown doesn't mean there's a curse in your family, but if you see there's this continuation of that, that could be an indication of a curse, okay? Usually it is. Repeated or chronic sil sickness, hereditary sickness. Everybody in your family line had uh, heart disease. Everybody in your family died of cancer or barrenness or whatever it is. If you see there's a consistency there, it could be a curse, all right? And that's what we pray and we ask the Lord. But here's the deal. I pray through everything. Like, oh, there could be something here. I'm going to just pray. It's free. Why don't we pray, right? Barrenness. A tendency to miscarry or related female problems, all right? And then uh, if you read through Deuteronomy 28, he talks about you can have blessings or curses. And he goes through the whole litany of, of scripture there. In number four, breakdown of marriage and family, family alienation where there's constant warring between siblings, where people don't get along, where, you know, there's a divorce and one divorce after another after another. Again, could be. Uh, continual, continuing 
financial insufficiency. How many times do we see that poverty spirit that's over family, right? And it, it, that's also a mindset. That's just not a spirit. That's a mindset. And, and so uh, you want to break that, all right? And being accident prone, we deal with that calamity spirit. When somebody constantly has accidents and, um, you know, I, I remember one time ministering to someone that, oh, my gosh, it was like every three months this person almost was decapitated, had, had a motorcycle accident, fell off his boat. I mean, it was just one thing after another. And that thing manifested big time, but he got set free. So a history of suicide and unnatural or untimely deaths. We know of people that have had many untimely deaths in their family. Okay? There's a root system there. Yeah. Now, again, you may say, well, how am I going to know? Well, Holy Spirit will let you know, but the thing is, we're not going to know where. I don't, half of my family, I don't, we don't know them. You know, they came from Italy. They, they, no one talked about anything. Everything was a secret. They didn't tell you anything. And so we didn't know half the stuff that went on or else it, you know, it, you, know you didn't find out until, you know, way after the fact. But, um, you know, or else, uh, like my husband's family, his grandmother and grandfather both were orphans. So we don't know about what's ha what was in their family line. So, so the Holy Spirit's like, don't worry about it. I got it covered. Yeah. You just pray through stuff. Yeah. And, if, and if we need to know something specific, he'll show us. Yeah. See, there's no pressure in this. That's what I love about God. And we've seen testimonies. We've seen change and transformation in people's lives as a result of this. And it's just beautiful. I just thank God for God. Um, the other thing I have in your hand is about false gods. You know, we, d this, uh, you know, false gods. All right, so... It could be you can idolize an individual. You can idolize um, you can idolize working out. Anything that you put before the Lord, right. we don't want that to become an idol in our lives. All right? Doesn't mean you're just praying to a statue or you're praying to Mary. You know, you're 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 it's anything that's consuming you before the Lord. And I always ask the Lord, you know, I, I never want to be out of alignment. I mean, we know of people that you know, the, I, I, one person that um, we were ministering to, the person actually would not receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, he said, because he would never put God before his wife. He didn't have an understanding. And that Jesus would create a beautiful marriage for you, you know. But he, wouldn't, he, he, he was just so deceived in his mind. Now, maybe eventually he did, but he, wouldn't, he, wouldn't, he would not acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior because he said, oh, no, I can never let anything come before my wife. That's commendable, right? But, but Jesus needs to be first because when you have Jesus first, he works everything out, right? So, you know, people have put their kids before their husband. They put their kids before God. You know, so we have to we have to get things in proper alignment. Okay, so uh, the breaking of the first two commandments, Exodus 20, 1 through 5, but I'll just read the first two. It says here, then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. See, God saying, listen, I don't want you to be in bondage. I don't want you to live in slavery. That's not your lot in life. He said, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, I'll read the other one. You shall not make for yourself any idol or any likeness, form or manifestation of what is in heaven or above or on earth beneath. You shall not worship them. You shall not serve them. And, um, you know, because in other words, it, it will bring a curse upon our lives. Idolatry. Listen to this in Isaiah 45, 21. It says, who declared it long ago? Was it not I, the Lord, and there is no other gods beside me, a consistently and uncompromisingly just and righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. None. There's no equal to our God. So we know that, you know, we always have to make sure, Lord, I, you know, I mean, I don't think any of you here have that issue. I mean, you know, we're, we're hungry for the Lord. We want freedom in our lives. We're not going to put anything before the Lord. But, um, but, you know, always ask Holy Spirit, am I? Right? And then, uh, and then we have rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. I'm going to get into that in a minute. First Samuel fifteen twenty three in the Amplified it says, "For rebellion is as serious as a sin of divination or witchcraft or fortune telling, and disobedience is as serious as false religion and idolatry." Okay, or, or another version says stubbornness. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has rejected you as king. This is dealing with Saul. But see that we have that a lot in our family, because a lot of our families have all that that. Um, 
superstition, right? We have occult backgrounds, uh, depending on, you know, I know the Hispanics, uh, not everybody's involved with Santeria and Macumba, you know, the Italians with the Italian witchcraft. We, know we deal with Indian, um, Native American. We deal with people from India, a lot of occult. R people in Romania, they would dedicate their babies to demon gods. Not, not knowing that's what they're doing, but that's what they were doing. So we have a lot of that generationally in our family. For, listen, I'm not, I'm not even going to touch Freemasonry tonight. That's a whole class by itself that we have to address because Freemasonry is something that really is presented as something that you're doing a good deed. But it's, there's, there's occult spirits that are involved in that. And when you start really learning about that, it's amazing and that people have to get set free from that. And that always gets people upset. And so, so we have um, rebellion. So like when, if you've experienced rejection in your life, you're, you either are going to be passive aggressive or you're going to be rebellious. Woo. And so <laughs> I was the rebellious one. I was like, you're not telling me what to do. You know, and that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. And, and, and so I don't, you know, listen, a lot of times when we're talking about witchcraft, it's not because, and I'll explain that here, and I'll show you how it works, it's not because you're operating under, you know, a demonic spirit and you're doing voodoo or, you know, releasing a vex hex or incantation over somebody, but that kind of a mindset, that kind of an attitude can open up a door, and it is as a sin of witchcraft, okay? So witchcraft here, there's three words that we always say when we're going to pray for people that have been involved or have that kind of a rebellious attitude. It's, it's where they manipulate, dominate, or control, or intimidate. All right, so when you see that type of personality, somebody that's very controlling or very domineering in your life, right, always looking to manipulate, getting slick, that they can be operating with a spirit of witchcraft. So when we say that, that doesn't mean that they are putting a, like a voodoo curse on you. There's two types. But when you see that kind of manipulation... And that control where it's so overwhelming, you feel the life being squeezed out of you because they're trying to control every move you make or micromanage everything, that can be a spirit of witchcraft. Yeah. And so you take authority over that. It's un very unhealthy. You, you can see that like in uh, unhealthy relationships between a parent and a child where they're, they're like the parent is smothering the kids out of fear, not because they want to be you know, ridiculous with them. It's just that there's so much fear involved that you're trying to control. Listen, I had so much fear in my life, and I had to help my husband because when my kids were little, I was, I was really getting nervous and afraid for them to do a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, I mean, I remember one time my husband just had a fit. The kids were outside riding a bike, and, I mean, they were like 12 now at this point, and I had my lawn chair out front and watching them ride on the street, my husband said, all right, enough is enough. I said, why? I said, what's wrong with that? He said, now, you remember, I grew up in inner city, so, of course, I'm thinking, like, they're going to get jumped or someone's going to attack them and come in the car and yank them out. You know, this is in Nutley. And he said, he goes, Trish, they're going to hate your guts. He said, stop already. Back off. And I'm like, what do you mean, you know? But this thing was so overwhelming that I thought, oh, my gosh, how am I going to not do this, you know? And so I had to really work on it, and I cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't want to do this, but this fear would grip me that I was so afraid that something would happen to them. And so I had to work on it. And then, of course, you know, Peter's like, Tricia, what are you doing? Like, I'm like, oh, my God, you're going to take him out on the boat? Oh, my God. Oh, Peter, are they? He was, he, he, my husband just looked at me like, Tricia. I know what I'm doing. I'm like, no, you didn't. You left him in the car alone when you went in the store. I saw that, you know. <laughs> so, of course, I never let him forget that. But, uh, you know, that was when they were two and four. But he ran and he goes, but I was able to see them. I said, I'm sorry. I'll never release that from you. I'll, I won't forgive you. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, it, but that, that stuck in my mind. But so, I'm, you know, like here it was, like I was just trying to dominate the situation and control it. Not, I wasn't trying to, to operate in this. And when the Lord started really dealing with me in this, I said, Lord, you have got to help me. I said, because I don't know how I'm going to not do this. And so I repented and renounced, and, and we're going to go through it. And then I had actively, because a lot of it's habit. It was my mother, I remember one time we were down the shore, and I, I said to Peter, just call my mom let her know we're here. My, my husband said, hey, mom. She goes, what happened? What's wrong? So my mom lived in fear. So we had fear, 
My mom lived through World War II. She had trauma from the war. And so I, we don't understand that as kids growing up. We lived in, in an environment where she was always afraid. Of, there was always a lot of fear. And so, so that, was a, there was, that was an impartation, a negative one. <laughs> I mean, she was trying to protect us, but it was just very like, Ugh. and so here I am, the very thing I hated, right? The very thing we hate, we do. And so now here I am, you know, you love your children, you want them protected, but then it's you're creating this, like this suffocating environment for them, and it's not healthy. So thank God that Peter was helping me. I helped him in other issues, just saying. But he was helping me in this area of just this control thing, right? So we all have our stuff, but, but, but mine was rooted in fear, fear of something happening. I had the enemy would always lie. And, and so when I had panic attacks, when I would have this fear, it was even if my husband was a minute late, you know, it wasn't that I thought, he was doing anything wrong. It was uh, this thought was always something's going to happen to him. So that was the enemy's way of tormenting me, right? So I had to get free from that. So see, there's different ways that this thing. This is a generational issue that was in my family line, and, and it affects us all differently. But but um, you know, I know for me it was really bad, and my mom really struggled with fear. Her mom may have. We didn't know, I mean, we didn't know her that well. But that mom, my grandmother got me pretty aggravated. She's the one I locked in the closet and threw the key down the store when I was about eight or nine because she was just mean. <laughs> so I thought, I'm getting rid of this one. But, <laughs> but she was just wild. I mean, right? I mean, she was just, anyway, so that was my way of handling things. I'm getting rid of her. And I threw the key down the sewer. <laughs> and they had to break the door down to get her out. So there I was, I was in a little, I was a little afraid at that point. But uh, that was my little way of getting rid of her, you know. But that's what we have to do to the enemy. Get rid of them. Lock them up. So, yeah. My father protected me because when my father came to look for me, he goes, he called me Pat. And he says, uh, where's your grandmother? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so he said, so she's calling me names in Italian. And one of them, I can't, I can't say all of them, but one of them, she, she kept calling me a rat. And so... When my father said to me, all right, where's the key, you know, to get her out of this closet? And it was in the hallway in there. We live in apartment buildings. And then, I, then that's when I cried. I said, why is Ruth down the sewer? So they had to break the door down, you know, to get her out. So she wanted to hit me. So, of course, I stood behind, behind my father, you know, <laughs> sticking my tongue at her. <laughs> but, but that's what happens. You know, you get rebellious, you know. But, I mean, she, I, I had to sleep in bed with her, and she would hit me and throw me off the bed, pinch me. And I'm thinking, how did, we, how did we manage getting these kind of grandparents, you know? I thought they were supposed to nurture and love you, you know? So uh, my way of getting rid of her was locking her up. Anyhow, so, you know, we all have our stuff of our family members, right? But um, anyway, so I had to forgive her. I did. I forgave my grandmother for her meanness. But you wonder what happened to her, that she would do that, right? And uh, although at that point I wasn't thinking about that, I just wanted to get rid of her. So, you know, again, we have, so we look down the line and see what, what was in our family. And that I don't want to repeat that behavior, right? And so, Lord, I need your help. Help me. I see there's, a, there's something here. Or, or maybe, you know, I get really hurt and I pull back. Or I get really angry and, you know, lash out or... You know, it's, it, not all of that's a spirit. Just remember that, okay? So it's behavioral things in, in addition to that. All right, you can have a vagabond spirit in Genesis 4, 12, and 13. I didn't type the scripture out, but it talks about um, when um, Cain and Abel, Cain was cursed, and he said, you'll be a vagabond. And that word vagabond means a fugitive. It means to wander aimlessly, to disappear, to stroll, or wander about. We had a family member that always wandered. We never knew where in the heck he was. And so, but you have church members, church people that hop and hop and hop and hop. You have fan people that just can't stay put, right? That can be a vagabond spirit. All right? So one who wanders from place to place without a fixed home, unsettled, and irresponsible can be. Family curses. All right? I love this portion of Scripture in Isaiah 59, 21. It says, this is my covenant promise with them, says the Lord Yahweh. From now on, my Holy Spirit will rest on them and not depart from them. And your, and your prophetic words, 
will fill their mouths and will not depart from them nor from their children nor from their descendants from now on and forever. I love that. This is a tri-generational blessing on your family. Now, the enemy always hits hard against families, right? But this is a blessing that we can stand on. There's so many marvelous scriptures about standing on your family. I love the one, and I, I always forget if it's, I think it's Jeremiah 30 or Isaiah or Ezekiel 30. But it says, refrain your eyes from, tear, from crying. And it says, weep no more. He said, because I will, um, ha, um, this is my paraphrase. He says, I'll, I'll remove your kids from the land of the enemy and bring them to my borders, you know. So I just love that portion because God's true. His word is true. He watches over his word to perform it. Um, so then we have here. So God wants our family to be delivered. There's, there's bloodline curses. An enemy comes to steal and destroy our family line, but no, -uh, it's not happening. And, you know, you may say, but it's not happening quick enough. Listen, God's word is true, and he watches over his word, like I said. And I'm telling you, you call for it. That's your inheritance. You stand for your family. And I have seen over and over and over. Uh, if you can watch a couple of weeks ago, and I can get the date, uh, Chuck Pierce has a lot of kids, right? So he's two were adopted, four of his own. And his one son, Isaac, was, like the Italians would say, a miserable. Oof. He was just mean. And he's a six foot five kid, you know, and he was just rough and rough. And, you know, sometimes you're around, you want to smack him. But he just always had this attitude, you know? And he just obviously had a lot of issues, you know, like in his heart. Who knows? It could have been school issues. Uh, you know how we all get, can act jerky. And so uh, Chuck would always ask, oh, like, just keep my son Isaac in prayer. Keep my son in prayer. And he became a hardcore alcoholic. Oh, my gosh. I mean, this guy, I mean, to where, like, his siblings, they all thought he was going to wind up dead, find him in the gutter dead. And... Um, one time we were in Israel, and my room was nearby where Chuck was, and, and his son got arrested. And I heard him screaming, yelling, <laughs> you know, his son. And he was telling his wife, leave him in jail. Leave him in jail. He said, because you know what? I, he goes, what, what are we going to do? We're not going to bail him out. He's got to learn. So, I mean, so there is one thing after another to even where a sibling said to him, you know, we're so scared that you're not going to make it because of how bad his, his alcohol addiction was, right? Well, there's a whole, like, he gives this whole testimony how God delivered him. But just recently, he was up there, and he was talking about a song that God gave him. And now he's married with two kids. And, I mean, he, he gives his whole testimony how God turned his life around. And when I tell you, you would think, like, him? He's going to get, I mean, God did such a work in this guy's life. And it's such a powerful thing. Like, he was, um, you know, just sharing a song, and he was singing a song, and, you know, like weeping over what God has done. And then um, his uncle, Keith, got up and said, you know, because he was very close with him, and he said he just knew that God told him, you've you got to back off. Stop trying to control the kid like we, you know, trying to control because you, you love him. You don't want to see them hurt, right? And, and he said, I had to watch him go through what he was going through. And it, I, was, I was weeping. I was, I was watching it because I remember, um, you know, I knew – I knew his son when, <laughs> you know, and so I just tell you that the promises of God are yes and amen. Amen. And so the enemy always tries to steal our family and that's our inheritance and we will not allow that. All right. And so we're going to pray through that and command um, some generational things to be broken off. So let me just get to some self-imposed curses and then we'll, we're going to pray, right? So Matthew uh, 12, 36 and 27 in the Passion says, you can be sure of this, when the day of judgment comes, everyone will be held accountable for every careless word he has spoken. Your very words will be used as evidence and your words will declare you either innocent or guilty, right? So watch what you're saying. Proverbs 6, 12, 2, you have been trapped by what you say, said, ensnared by the words of your mouth let me just say this and even when you see your sibling or your child acting like a turkey don't call them names don't say don't look at them they're they're, they're act, you know just like in other words don't rehearse who they are like what they're doing rehearse what god says you know when you're praying for them pray say they're a mighty man or woman of god they are there, walking in the favor of the Lord. Decree the opposite of what the enemy is trying to 
you know, what you're actually seeing. It's not that you're, not in, you're, that you're in denial. You're calling those things as being not as though they are. Speak life over them. Yes. All right? God bless you. And so, uh, anyway, so even over ourselves, listen to this. I, I was thinking about this from the book of Numbers when Caleb, <coughs> uh, and you have Caleb and um, who's the other one? Joshua and Caleb. And so in Numbers 13:30 it says, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession of it, for we will certainly conquer it. What? They were going to conquer the mountains, the promised land, right? Numbers 13, <coughs> excuse me, 31 says, and he amplified, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people of Canaan, for they are too strong for us. So look at the difference here. Now, they were, they were leaders, all right? They were leaders, and, and they were called to go sco scout out the land. So you had Joshua and Caleb who said, hey, we're able to take it. This is ours. And the other one said, uh-uh, because we look like grasshoppers in their sight when you read through the scripture. So which one is it? Which one is it going to be? See, we have to ask Holy Spirit to help us change our perspective that we see from a conquering perspective, not a defeated perspective. Because the Bible says we're more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. Yeah, but you don't understand my life. Everything is failed. I don't care. God is saying you're more than a conqueror. There's no, he listen, it's never too late to shift. Never too late to shift. And we're in a new season. This is a new era. And God is telling us that we are crossing over. We have crossed through that Red Sea. And the, it, the Egyptians that were following us, it's up to us to cut our losses and say enough. Enough. I'm not tolerating that anymore. This is what I'm standing for. And you may have to war. Listen, in Ezekiel, I think it's 21, it says whenever you're crossing over a threshold, that their python is waiting. There's the enemy that's waiting at the threshold to, to war to stop you. Always that happens. And so when there's warfare, don't be surprised, but keep going. Say, uh-uh, this is my vision. <coughs> he says that we have to have a vision. My people perish for a lack of knowledge, but it's saying that write your vision down. What's your vision? Are you believing for a generational blessing? Are you believing for your family? Are you believing for your life to turn around? Let that be your focal point. So, uh-uh, nothing's stopping me. I'm going to keep on going. Yeah, you're going to have obstacles that come before you, but God, he's going to try the enemy because he doesn't want you walking in the fulfillment of your destiny. So that's why we have to be careful. So watch the example. So now this was in uh, what's uh, Derek's book, okay? Example of word curses. All right, so now we had indications of a curse. <coughs> Excuse me, I just have to get a sip. Um, but here we have example of word curses. So mental or emotional breakdown. It's driving me crazy. I can't take it anymore. I'm never going to be able to handle this. You know, that kind of stuff. Don't say that stuff. You may say, why? It's No, don't say it. Don't say it's driving you crazy. Just say, Lord, help me. <laughs> I, today, my back was killing me. So then what am I saying? I'm teaching on word curses. I'm teaching, right? This is me today. Oh, my God, my back is killing. I said, what am I saying? No, I'm blessed. My back is fine. <laughs> you know, so we, we do it, right? But I had to, like, shut up. And so, uh, but I was saying it. Okay. Repeated or chronic sickness. All right. Oh, whenever there's a bug, I'll catch it. Oh, it's flu season. I'm going to get it. Baloney. No, you're not. It runs in my family, so I'm next. I know of family members that uh, everyone pretty much in their family died at the age of 59, and they thought they were going to die at 59. Well, they didn't die yet. So, hey, listen, don't believe that. You be the one that crosses over. So barrenness, tendency to miscarry, okay, or related alienation. I don't think I'll ever get married. We break the power of those words in Jesus' name. I got the curse again, women. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, we, we speak barrenness over things. And so, you know, you can just speak barrenness over your jobs. It doesn't have to just be over your physical body. What are you saying? Because you get, it's such habit, all right? And then a breakdown of marriage and family alienation. Somehow I always knew my husband would find another woman. I always knew he'd cheat on me. I don't trust men. I, I met with, I, I can't tell you how many times I met with, uh, women who just, um, and I used to be one of them, who used to just always put men down. Men are jerks. Men are this. They're stupid. They can't help it. They're the, and the Lord said to me, what are you saying? <laughs> that is wrong. And I'm like, why? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Lord. And so, listen, and he told me how wrong I was. So I had to repent. 
We can't say those things. That's wrong. But you're cursing men. You're, you can't do that. But think of how in the, in the TV shows, and I haven't watched regular TV in a long time, but how did they always make the men? Like idiots. They made them seem like weak and, and, and inept. That, that, I'm sorry, it was wrong. That's wrong. That's not how God created men to be with yeah, women. Right, right. And so, but, but there, that's what really was really instilled and ingrained. You would see so much of that. And then you would buy into that. That's wrong, women. We can't do that. We have to honor and respect, just like women want to be honored and respected. We have to honor and respect men. But somebody said to me, but they make it so easy. No, not all of them. But, but I'm, <laughs> let me just, I'll end right here with that one. So continuing, continuing financial insufficiency. Uh, this is what they had in the book. I can't afford to tithe. I can't afford to do this. I can't afford. I can't afford. I'll never amount. I can't uh, go here. Yeah, you can if you save money. If you put little at a time, you can afford to go on a vacation. It might be a weekend. But, you know, like, but start small, but keep starting, you know, to, to go to Dave Ramsey, get financial help. But see, there's a, a spirit of lack. There's that spirit of financial insufficiency or a poverty mindset where it's not only financially, but there's a poverty spirit where it's a poverty mindset that you'll never amount to anything. You can never have a better uh, clothing or buy something not on sale or, you know, it's, it's a mindset. So watch what you're saying. Say, Lord, I thank you that I'm blessed. Lord, I thank you that you supply all my needs according to your riches in heaven. He owns all the gold and silver in heaven. He doesn't want you to, to now again, I'm not talking about, you know, some people, you know, you get crazy with a lot of this stuff. I'm talking about he wants you blessed, period. All right, then being accident prone always happens to me. I'm just such a clumsy person. I always fall in the snow. I'll always slip and fall, you know, things like that. Watch what you're saying. All right, so history of suicides and death. All right, I'd rather die than go on living this way. My father died so young, so I will too. I, how many times have we counseled people that were in such hardship that they would just fantasize about dying? All right, so that's, that, that will open up a door to a spirit of suicide and death. That's a demon. So you don't want to align with that, Okay. And then, um, so we want to repent of negative confession over yourself. So it's not like you have to panic over this. It's like, Lord, like, is there anything that I'm in agreement with that's not pleasing to you? So we want to, we want to break that. So I have here um, steps to release. Uh, I think it's six steps to release. So we're going to pray, but I just want you to see this. <coughs> it says here, confess your faith in Christ. Repent of all your rebellion and sins. Claim forgiveness of all sins. Forgive people who have hurt or have harmed you in any way. Renounce all contact with anything occult or satanic and also Freemasonry. We'll do a whole class on Freemasonry. And now ready to pray the, uh, the, the, the release from any curse. So um, I just wanted to just, just pray. I wrote something. I, don't, I can't remember if Peter changed some of the things on your handout, but I had uh, just a little a prayer um, that I want to pray over generational stuff right now. Then we're going to pray over just, we're going to renounce and break some generational curses and some word curses. So I have here, um, I'm going to read it first and then we can read it together, okay? I command every generational curse over my life and associated with my family to be broken off me now. And in Jesus' name, I decree the shed blood of Jesus Christ that sets me free. I destroy the effects of the sins of my uh, relatives or my ancestors that, uh, that affected my life by the power of God. I break and destroy every generational curse over my life in Jesus' name. That's, now, that's just a general prayer, but what I did write, is this on your handout? Okay, so what I want you to do, see, there are certain things you can do alone, and the other things you, you should really make an appointment. Okay, this stuff you can do alone because, uh, you know, you know what's in your family line. And so, like, I, you know, you can then, because so, what I'm saying here is you repent and be specific of certain issues that have been in your family line. Listen, self-pity. You can have uh, rebellion. You know, you can have disobedience. You can have violence. You can have anger. You know, there's uh, barrenness, right? Divorce. Uh, there's barrenness. I just said that in your family. Um, you know, so there's, there's whatever it is that's, 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 you feel that's there 
say it. Pray through it. All right? So here's an example again of how you can pray. All right? And so, um, you know, the, some of sexual sin, we're gonna, that's going to be one of the other classes we're going to talk about, sexual sins and uh, soul ties and um, how that affects you. Um, and so, um, you know, you want to ask Holy Spirit for direction, but you want to break that off, and we're going to pray, okay? And then um, let me just see what else I have here because um, I know it's getting late. So the other thing I wrote on your handout is this is what you want to get in your head that you always want to know and you want to, you know, just have it in your Rolodex in your mind. You repent. Let's say you remember something. It's not like, oh, my God, like someone I was dealing with said, well, when I knew I sinned, I, I pulled back from God for like several days and I didn't want to pray or I didn't want to go to church because they felt so condemned. Well, guess what? God is not the author of condemnation. In Romans 8, 1, it says that he's, he does not condemn. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That's the enemy. The Holy Spirit convicts you. God never condemns you. Right. So when you're feeling that inadequate or that bad, just reach out to someone. But just I want you to know that's not God. He would never do that to us. And so just choose to forgive yourself right away. So you want to repent. You want to revoke or renounce. Like he, uh, Derek Prince always uses revoke. We always say renounce. The bottom line is you're canceling it, okay? So replace it with the wrong, the wrong confession with truth. Lord, your word says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm not a mistake. I'm not inadequate. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, always have a scripture that can back up the, the op, you know, that will declare the opposite of what you're going through. Use your authority. We all have authority. Now, the enemy doesn't want you to know you have authority. Every single one of us have authority. And the more you recognize who you are and you meditate on the word, that's what the enemy's terrified of. He's under our feet. He says, I've given you authority to tread on scorpions and serpents. But now I'm not telling you to go out and look for them. But in your sphere of, of, of authority, it's like, don't mess with my family. Don't come in my home. And so, Lord, I just apply the boundary of the bloodline here. And so, oh, no, I'm not accepting this. So, you, you know, you know your rights. Know your spiritual rights. All right? So we release the power of the blood. That's a whole other one we want to teach on, our blood covenant. We have power, and God is God. The Bible says in Psalm 89, he never alters his covenant. Never. It's eternal. He, he's true. To his word, it's a God, he's a God of covenant. And there's, so there's power in the blood. We walk by faith, not, not feelings. We build up our faith, right? And so we get under the anointing. We decree I'm coming out of every attack. We decree our family's coming out of every attack. And so you say, yeah, but my family, I've been praying, I've been praying. Don't give up. All I know is that the word of God works. That's all I know. And so I just, I'm not going to try to figure God out. I'm going to trust him, all right? So why don't we stand? <clears throat> And we're going to pray. And then afterwards, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them, okay? So on your handout, we can read this together. <clears throat> All right, you ready? You ready? Okay. Okay, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God and the only way to God and that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. I give up my rebellion and all my sins and I submit myself to you as Lord. I confess all my sins before you and ask you for your forgiveness. Now, I just want to pause here. So when you're home alone, you confess your sins before the Lord, okay? Now, especially for any sins that expose me to a curse, release me from the consequences of my ancestor's sin. And then you can just write there specifically, and then whatever you know ancestrally that's in your family line, okay? <clears throat> okay. By decision of my will, I forgive all who have harmed me, or wrong me, just as I want God to forgive me. And in particular, I forgive. And you can say as many people as you need to say there. And then it says, I renounce 
all contact with anything occult or satanic. If I have any uh, contact objects, I commit myself to destroy them. I cancel all Satan's claims against me. Now, and I also, let me just say this, uh, where it says I renounce anything occultic, um, like if you had uh, tarot cards, Ouija board, or um, I don't know, whatever, some uh, palm, uh, palm, when you've had your palm bread or anything like that, just be specific and say that, okay? Even, because most of the time we did for fun. We didn't know, right? So, uh, okay. I command myself, all right, I cancel, all, I said that, right? I renounce all, okay. Lord Jesus, I believe. That on the cross you took on, cross you took on, yourself, on yourself every curse, every curse that, would me, that would come upon me. So I ask you now, ask you now to, release to release me from every curse, from every curse over, my life, over my life in your name, in your name Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. By, faith, By faith, I now receive, I now receive my, release, my release, and I thank you for it you. in Jesus' name. And uh, like I said, there's so, this was from his book, but there's so many ways that we pray this. But I like being very specific. But let me just pray over you, okay? Now, Lord, I just thank you for the power of your blood. And, Lord, I just take authority over every generational curse right now. I bind every spirit that would try to harass you, pe the people here, especially a tormenting spirit. I break off every assignment of the enemy in Jesus' name. Lord, I take authority over self-pity. I take authority over spirits of um, depression, spirits of hopelessness and despair. I bind these spirits now in Jesus' name, and I command release in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, I just thank you for uprooting anything that's trying to entangle your people. Lord, I speak to every spirit of fear, every generational curse of fear, in Jesus' name, and I command complete release in Jesus' name. I speak to every spirit of expected rejection, perceived rejection, and rejection, and I command you to loose your people now. Loose the people of God now in Jesus' name. I break off every assignment of disobedience, every spirit of disobedience. I command you to go now. I break this generational curse in Jesus' name. Now, I want you to say this. Sometimes you just need to take a deep breath or just shake yourself, but... You don't have to have a manifestation, just so that you know that. Now, I speak to every, uh, every spirit of um, hopelessness and despair, spirits of suicide, premature death and destruction. I break your assignment off now in Jesus' name. Now, this, even this, this fear that's been released from this COVID pandemic, I, break, I take authority over this spirit of fear in Jesus' name, this spirit of panic in Jesus' name. Lord, we just break this assignment off your people now. We say no to it in Jesus' name. We loose the power of the blood of Jesus. Lord, your word says that by the stripes of Jesus, we are the healed of the Lord. And Lord, your word says in Psalm 91 that no evil will come nigh our dwelling and no plague shall be full. So that's your promise, Lord. So, Lord, we just thank you that we are covered by your blood and that no weapon formed against us. There's weapons that will be formed, but they're not going to form against us in Jesus' name. So, Lord, we just thank you for that. We break off every spirit of witchcraft, every occult spirit in Jesus' name. We take authority over every generation of spirit of manipulation, control, and dominance in Jesus' name. Lord, we just even speak to every uh, spirit that would just try to torment minds in Jesus' name. We cut you off now through the power of the blood. And, Lord, we just speak to every spirit of poverty in Jesus' name. We break off every, every spirit that affects soul, the soul of man here, every spirit of poverty that's kept you in bondage and captivity. We break that off. Spirits of bondage and captivity, addictions, we take authority over that in Jesus' name. And even uh, infirmity, spirits of infirmity. We break a generational curse of infirmity. In Jesus, name. in Jesus' name, all, you know, we, we speak to ADD, ADHD, all kinds of autism. We speak to this assault that has come against the body of Christ. We loose the power of the blood of Jesus and decree complete freedom and deliverance in Jesus' name. Lord, we just thank you that you are the great I am. 
We thank you, Lord, that absolutely nothing shall be called impossible with you. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you came to set the captives free. And for this very purpose, your word says, Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the enemy. And those are works of the enemy that I just called out. Now, Lord, I just thank you, Father, for your hand that's upon each and every one of us here. Yes. Lord, and again, I just speak to roots, and I say dry up. Dry. You roots, dry up. Yes. You will not dry. take root again. We say dry up now in Jesus' name. And Holy Spirit, I just thank you for your brooding presence. Holy Spirit, for your fertilization. You are fertilizing us with your anointing, with your brooding presence to produce fruit, to bear fruit in this season. We will not be barrenness. And I speak to barrenness right now. I take authority over barrenness and say, you will not cause the people to be sterile any longer. We will produce fruit. We are not a barren people. So God, I just thank you. Holy Spirit, I thank you. I thank you for your amazing love for each and every one of us here. And that that's your will and that's your desire for our freedom. And I bless each and every person here. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. 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 God is good.